Welcome to our IRA seminar series. It is my great honor to introduce to you today um, the seminar speaker who is a rare universal talent of our time, Professor Michael Bronstein. His seminal work in geometrically inspired machine learning has not only led to profound insights in the latter field, but saw Michael become an entrepreneur by founding Fabula AI, a company that was subsequently acquired by Twitter, where he remains the head of graph machine learning to this day. Michael is currently the DeepMind Professor of AI at Oxford University and a fellow of Exeter College there. Apart from being an investor, he is leading machine learning at Project SETI, a non-profit organization aiming to listen to and translate the communication of whales. Amongst the many academic accolades, Michael has earned the silver medal of the Royal Academy of Engineering, the Dal Molly Prize, multiple Google Faculty Research Awards, multiple Amazon Machine Learning Awards, and multiple ERC grants. His talk today will be on neural diffusion PDEs, differential geometry, and graph neural networks. Without further ado, Michael, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for the introduction and for the invitation. So it's really a pleasure. Uh, to be here, even though virtually. And uh, today I would like to talk about some of the recent um, works that we did with uh, colleagues at Twitter and uh, some external collaborators uh, that relate to craft neural networks specifically, but maybe look at them from a slightly different perspective. And I should say that I should probably already update this talk because we've done a few other papers as well as uh, there have been uh, other papers by other groups that. Uh, advance this topic even further. So just for context, let me start maybe a little bit from an historic parenthesis. And, and here I would like to quote um, Herman Weil, who said that symmetry as wide or as narrow as you may define its meaning is one idea by which men for ages has tried to comprehend and create order, beauty, and perfection. And uh, I think this highlights the importance of this concept in science, in art, and engineering. And uh, Philip Anderson, who won the Nobel Prize in Physics, uh, maybe put it even more briefly, that it's only slightly overstating to say that physics is the study of symmetry. And indeed, we find symmetry as the very uh, foundation for modern understanding of our universe, what is now called the standard model. Uh, you can derive it entirely from considerations of symmetry, maybe with the exception of gravity that, that somehow doesn't fit exactly this, uh, this uh, picture. So the origins of this um, uh, approach, actually, you can uh, trace them back to uh, Felix Klein's uh, fundamental uh, work that is now called the, the Erlangen program, named after the university where uh, he presented this uh, research um, in uh, 1872. And the idea was to unify uh, the study of geometries, and at that time uh, there were already multiple geometries, not only the Euclidean one, but also other types of geometry through the study of invariants or symmetries that were formalized using the language of group theory. And that's uh, exactly the kind of idea that, that we try to promote uh, as what we call the geometric deep learning, and maybe a little bit arrogantly, uh, the Erlangen program of, of machine learning, which of course not trying to, to to, to, to approach the, 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 the contribution of uh, Felix Klein, but to take uh, the spirit of his uh, formalism and approach to geometry. Uh, basically, in these two of different uh, neural network architectures that were developed historically for different types of data, we can derive them all from these uh, fundamental considerations. For example, convolutional neural networks, you can derive them from uh, uh, translation invariants, uh, uh, for example, recurrent neural networks like LSTMs that were actually developed in this institute and one of the most popular architectures in uh, the field of deep learning from uh, consideration of uh, certain time symmetry or time warping. Uh, and today we'll be talking about graph neural networks, so they arise from uh, permutation invariants. So um, basically, if we look at uh, the simplest setting of the machine learning problem, you can think of it as a kind of function estimation. So you have a black box, a function that you, that you try to, to, to estimate, and you have examples of data, inputs and outputs of this function. So a good example is image classification. You, you get examples of inputs of cats and dog uh, images, and the outputs are labels. And uh, you want to, to be able to fit this function uh, to the training data that, that for which you know the labels, and you, you want it to generalize well 
to previously unseen data. And basically looking at this problem this way, you, you would hope that you can uh, use results from approximation theories. And these kind of problems have been studied very extensively. The problem is that most of the results work in small number of dimensions, whereas machine learning problems are high dimensional. So uh, we run into a phenomenon that is called the curse of dimensionality. And the idea of geometric deep learning, you can think of it as a way of dealing with the curse of dimensionality by uh, utilizing what we call uh, geometric priors, basically the assumption that the data is not just a high dimensional vector of, let's say, pixels, but it also has underlying geometric structure. Uh, so it has a domain, so it lives on some domain, and the domain has some associated symmetry group that describes its structure. So this symmetry group uh, acts on signals that live on the domain through the group representation that might be different depending on the kind of data that, that we have, for example, scalar value or vector value data, or even more elaborate things. Uh, this uh, representation might act differently. And finally, the functions that we want to apply on this data might incorporate these uh, inductive biases uh, through invariance or equivariance. So probably the best example is convolutional neural networks, where uh, we are talking about images. So images, the underlying domain is a plane or a grid on which we can define the, the translation symmetry. So it acts on images through the shift operator, and then equivariant, shift equivariant functions that are applied to images are convolutions. So you can derive convolutional neural networks from these uh, uh, first principles of, uh, uh, of group equivariance. Another more recently prominent example is graph neural networks. So in this case, the graph, its uh, particular structural characteristic is the lack of ordering of the nodes. So we're talking about the permutation group that reorders the nodes of the graph and it acts through the permutation matrix on the uh, on the node feature uh, vectors and uh, the, the architectures uh, uh, that, that do learning on graphs implement uh, permutation equivariance through some form of message passing. So this is the, uh, also one of the most popular incarnations of graph neural networks. Now, this blueprint can be applied to different types of data, to different domains, whether it's grids, uh, meshes and graphs. And one thing that you notice is that uh, the first two grids and, and meshes can be considered as a discretization of some continuous structures. So for example, you can think of a grid as discretization of a plane, let's say, or maybe a volume or uh, in general, some homogeneous space. Meshes are a discretization of manifolds or surfaces, but we don't have a continuous model for graphs, at least not immediate analogy. So this is something that I find personally disturbing and I would like to uh, try to get rid of this, uh, of this uh, lack of, of symmetry. Now, if you look at how graph neural networks work, basically, as I said, they uh, operate by some form of message passing. So you have uh, each node that is surrounded by its neighbors. You look at the feature vectors of the neighbors and you aggregate them using a local uh, permutation invariant function because you don't have a canonical order of the neighbors. When you apply it everywhere in the graph locally, then you get a function that produces permutation equivariant node features. And it was shown actually recently and maybe even historically before that, that uh, message passing type graph neural networks where you appropriately choose this uh, aggregation function are equivalent to uh, a graph isomorphism test that was introduced by uh, Boris Weisfeiler and uh, Andre Lehmann in the 60s. And it's an iterative color refinement procedure that starts with the graph that has uh, equal labels or so basically colors that are attached to, to its nodes and it tries to, to distinguish between differently structured neighbors. So initially we can distinguish between neighbors uh, of two different types. We have a, a, a blue neighbor with two blue, uh, sorry, a blue uh, node with two blue neighbors and the blue node with three blue neighbors. And because of uh, the assumption that this uh, local function is injective, we uh, produce two different new colors for these uh, structures. And we can repeat this procedure multiple times until the color stops changing. And at this point, we output their histogram. And if I give you another graph and I get a different distribution of colors, then I can for sure say that the graphs are not isomorphic. So they, they have different structure. But if we have the same outputs that we actually don't know, and you can find uh, simple examples of non-isomorphic graphs that the, the device for element test cannot distinguish, like an example shown here. 
So it's a necessary but insufficient condition. And you can also explain why it happens because essentially what this algorithm does, it constructs these rooted trees at every node. And uh, you can see that, that from this standpoint, the nodes that I highlight here in red are indistinguishable. Now we can do several things. So you can lift the graph into a higher order structure. So for example, a simplicia or a cell complex, and you can define message passing between these structures. And we can show that uh, in this way you get uh, uh, you get a graph neural network that is strictly more powerful than the vice uh, uh algorithm. But by far more common approach is to do what is called positional encoding. So this method originally uh, became popular in the transformer architectures and now is used, I would say, ubiquitously in graph neural networks. And the idea is that you pre-color by attaching some additional features the nodes of the graph. And this way you can see that you can distinguish between, uh, between different uh, structures. And there are many types of positional encoding. For example, you can even use random features. You can use the eigenvectors of the graph or Poisson. You can count graph substructures. We've had recent paper, and actually there are several papers that look at graphs as a collections of subgraphs that are extracted from the given graph. But I think the bottom line is that there is no clear recipe, and that every time people argue for different encoding based on a given application. So we'd like to give maybe some more principled view on that. And the last problem that I would like to mention is the phenomenon of over-squashing, which is not specific to graph neural networks, but probably the most acute there. And the, the problem is that when you have, when you need to propagate information from distant nodes by multiple steps of message passing, and you have too many neighbors, so the volume on the, of the graph grows uh, very fast, exponentially fast, like what happens, for example, in social networks, then you end up with a lot of feature vectors that you need to squeeze into a single vector. And this hinders the propagation of information on the graph. And uh, what is done empirically to, 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 to mitigate this problem is to decouple the input graph from the information propagation graph. So the traditional graph neural networks use the same graph given as input to propagate information. So somehow you discover the structure of the graph from, by, from sending information. So what is done is what typically is called graph rewiring. Uh, and again, there are multiple ways of doing it. Uh, the, probably the, the easiest way is doing just neighborhood sampling that originally was proposed for scalability issues, but also multi hop filters that look at neighbors maybe multiple times removed. Uh, you can rewire the graph by changing its connectivity. Uh, you can learn the graph. And again, there is no clear answer what is the right way of doing. So I would like to present three recent papers. So actually now uh, uh, two of them are already presented and one will be presented at iClear that is forthcoming, and I will like to address some of the problems that I outlined here. So basically continuous models, positional encoding, and uh, graph rewiring. And if you want uh, a lightweight reading uh, rather than reading the papers themselves, so we also have accompanying uh, blog posts for uh, these papers. So let me start with the uh, neural graph diffusion. And diffusion is probably one of the physical processes that have been uh, formalized mathematically uh, for quite some time. And uh, the first attempt probably goes back to an anonymous publication in the uh, Transactions of the Royal uh, Society, published in 1701, uh, that even though it was published without name, somehow everyone knew that the author would, was uh, Isaac Newton. He would become Sir Isaac four years afterwards. And they described uh, an experimental setup uh, and also an analysis of it that now is called the Newton law of cooling, telling that the temperature a cold body loses in a given time is proportional to the temperature difference between the object and the environment. And uh, the terminology, it was written in Latin, the Newton uses the word calor, which literally means heat, and nowadays we understand it in a different sense. The, the right terminology is temperature, which is the average kinetic energy of molecules. But at that time, it was not even uh, uh, coined. So fast forward uh, 100 years, even more. So this, this time is Joseph Fourier. Already calculus existed and was uh, widely used. And uh, he, uh, in his treatise on the uh, analytic theory of heat, uh, formulates what is now what is called the, the Fourier heat conduct law, that heat flux resulting from thermal conduction is proportional to the magnitude of the temperature gradient and opposite to it inside. And final step 
uh, what is called the thick law uh, or second law of diffusion, that the temperature change in time equals to the heat flux to a volume. So taken together, all this allows us to write the diffusion equation. So if we have some stuff on some domain, let's say temperature, the difference, right, the gradient of this the temperature creates the heat flux and the conservation condition tells us that the change in time, the temporal derivative is equal to the divergence of this, uh, of this heat flux. So in the sense, no heat is created, it disappears. And this is the, the partial differential equation, the, the, heat, uh, uh, the heat equation that describes this phenomenon. Now, uh, you can, in the simplest case, write uh, the diffusion equation in this form. It's homogeneous and isotropic, meaning that the propagation properties are the same at every point of the domain. You can uh, interpret it as the gradient flow, basically a minimization uh, process of some energy functional that is called the Dirichlet energy. And you can give it uh, a closed form solution in the Euclidean setting as convolution with a Gaussian filter. So basically it spreads, it's a low pass filter that, that spreads information uh, increasingly. But what is more interesting when the diffusivity properties are position dependent, so in this case we have a, a non-homogeneous diffusion or more generally, an isotropic diffusion when it's not only position but also direction dependent. And this kind of diffusion attracted a lot of interest in the image processing community where you try to, for example, remove noise from images. You can, of course, uh, just run a low pass filter like convolution with a Gaussian filter, but this way you, you average out the noise, but you also destroy the discontinuities, the edges in the image that are visually important for image perception. So the idea that was uh, the, the seminal work of uh, Pietro Perona and Jitendra Malik from 1990 to use an adaptive diffusion that uh, uses a diffusivity function that is inversely proportional to the norm of the image gradient. So in a sense, when you get to an edge, you stop the diffusion process or slow it down. So you don't blur across uh, discontinuities. And here you can see an example. So Sir Isaac blurred with a homogeneous diffusion, a Gaussian kernel, versus uh, this non-linear, non-homogeneous diffusion. Actually, interestingly, Perón and Malik called it an isotropic diffusion, which is, of course, not correct, because it's position, but not direction dependent. And there was an entire zoo of methods, of variational methods, uh, PD-based image processing methods, that started with a very neat idea that, that basically have some functional that somehow measures how your image should look like, and you write uh, a differential equation, basically a gradient flow that comes from the euler lagrange uh, optimality conditions that uh, evolves the image towards the optimum. And uh, many of the ideas that now we now see in, in deep learning, whether it's attention, for example, uh, can actually be traced back to some of these ideas in image processing, maybe in slightly different reincarnation. So essentially what we're doing here is a kind of reinvention or reformulation or, or adoption of these ideas in uh, a new setting, which hopefully also gives an interesting perspective on, uh, on graphs. So basically, we can now try to formulate the same things that we had in the Euclidean domain on a graph. Basically, we have almost one-to-one -one analogy to things that happen uh, in the Euclidean domain. So we can define a gradient. So I assume that I have some node features that I denote by x. The gradient will be an edgewise signal that, that uh, takes the differences between these features. The divergence is the opposite, right? So I take uh, edgewise signals and I sum them up uh, on all the edges that, that uh, share a node. And not surprisingly, these two operators are adjoint with respect to uh, the, the right inner products on the node and edge signals. And we can define the Laplacian as divergence of the gradient or minus divergence of the gradient depending on the convention. And uh, you can also interpret it geometrically. Basically, what the Laplacian tells you is how different you are from your uh, neighbors. Basically, it's the difference between the, uh, some weighted average of the neighbors and the node itself. And now we have all the components to write the diffusion equation on the graph. So it has exactly the same structure as before. So we have the gradient. We have a diffusivity function that, for simplicity, we assume to be normalized. So we, it's, it's, it's a stochastic matrix. And this is the divergence. So this, uh, this is a nonlinear equation, so it has to be solved numerically. And we need to discretize the time. And the easiest uh, way is to just take a fixed step in time that I call tau. 
and use an explicit or forward Euler scheme. So we replace the temporal derivative by forward difference, and I can write the iteration formula in matrix vector form, or uh, as this matrix Q, where uh, basically it's, uh, the iteration is given in a linear, uh, as a linear combination of features, where Q is actually non-linearly dependent on the features themselves. And it also has the graph adjacency structure, so it's local, it's usually sparse. And if we choose the step size to be sufficiently small, this scheme is stable. So basically we can use uh, the theory of uh, numerical uh, PDEs to, to prove this result. Now, what is interesting that if you assume tau to be equal to one, because of this normalization, we essentially get uh, the graph attention network. So in this case, we interpret the diffusivity as attention. And we don't need to stop here, so we can use other numerical schemes. So here is a semi-implicit or backward Euler scheme, so we use the backward derivative in time, and now the iteration formula is implicit in the sense that we need to solve a linear system of this form to get the next step. And uh, in other words, we need to approximately invert this matrix B. So the iteration matrix is now dense, so you can think of it as a multi-hop filter that touches not only your immediate neighbors, but multiple neighbors, but the good thing is that semi-implicit schemes are unconditionally stable for any choice of tau. And of course, there are many other techniques. So in numerical analysis, the, the, the bread and butter is a multi-step runge kuta scheme, and uh, there are also adaptive step size, multi-grid methods, and so on and so forth. And this is the framework that we use. So we call it a very modestly, obviously, GRAND, standing for graph uh, neural diffusion. So basically, you start with some initial features on the graph. You diffuse them by solving uh, the graph diffusion equation using iterative solver. And uh, the diffusivity here is parametric, and the parameters are learnable. And here, by choice, intentionally, we use a time-independent diffusivity function. So basically, in deep learning language, it means that we have shared parameters across layers. We can do it otherwise. So basically, again, the idea here is that we have some physical system that uh, we can control by some parameters. So these are the coefficients of the diffusivity function. And we regard the solution of this diffusion equation at some time that can also be learnable, uh, 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 learnable time or maybe some hyperparameter of the, of the system. We uh, basically, we use the, the, the state of this system at some at a point of time as a way of parameterizing some class of functions. So we are not really interested here in solving accurately the diffusion equation. It's our way of representing uh, solutions, We're representing a hypothesis class. So in a sense, we can think of our learning problem as a kind of control problem by choosing, in this case, well, a single set of parameters, but more generally, it can be also a trajectory in time that, that controls this, this physical system. We produce some, some output. So I think it gives a new perspective on all problems. So as I will show, hopefully, uh, in the remaining time, I convince you that, that we can also address problems like oversmoothing and bottlenecks. It allows to interpret and formalize existing graph neural network architectures as discretizations of graph diffusion equations. But uh, it also potentially uh, allows to derive new architectures that do not have immediate analogies in the zoo of graph neural network architectures, for example, arising from multi-step adaptive or implicit or multi-grid schemes. Uh, we can also get some theoretical guarantees, like stability conversions. And in some recent papers, we also show, for example, that we can uh, analyze the expressive power by looking at the, at the limit case, basically where these diffusion converges, how can it separate uh, different classes of, of nodes. We can also relate it to, for example, uh, the problem of heterophily, when our uh, the structure of our features on the graph is not consistent with the structure of the graph. So my neighbors are different from me. And it also establishes links to other fields that are probably less known in graph neural networks, and I would dare say in machine learning, such as differential geometry and algebraic topology. And I said I will say a few words about it towards the end. So here's one example. So we know that uh, graph neural networks, at least of certain type, tend to oversmooth, and in general, it is difficult to uh, construct deep graph neural networks. So uh, the performance starts degrading after adding a certain number of layers, and here is the typical result how it looks like, so these dotted lines. 
So in our case, we actually don't have immediately the notion of depth. So the depth here is replaced by diffusion time. And if we use a simple explicit scheme, then the number of layers through the step size corresponds to the diffusion time. And with adaptive schemes for Gumball, we can afford taking bigger steps whenever necessary, so less layers, right? Less iterations of the diffusion. In implicit scheme, schemes, you can think of them as trade-off between depths or widths. So basically less iterations, but bigger filters, like using convolutional networks, using maybe filters with bigger receptive field. And of course, some benchmarks, so we cannot publish a paper, I think, in mainstream machine learning conferences without being epsilon better on some benchmarks, so take it with a grain of salt. Uh, I think what is interesting is that if you compare, let's say, to, to, to run of the mill architectures like, like GUT, uh, we perform more or less uh, with the same accuracy, but requiring way less parameters, and that's exactly because of this uh, time-independent diffusivity, or in other words, shared parameters across layers. So, so far, it's interesting relation to diffusion. It's not very surprising. I, I, I still didn't answer what actually, uh, do we have a continuous model for the graph, right? So, so far we had a continuous model for time in the diffusion equation. But if we go back and again to diffusion in the plane, so if we discretize the plane uh, on a grid like shown here, so that the spatial derivatives, the Laplacian or the divergence and the gradient, we can discretize them in different ways, right? So here is a discretization of Laplacian with, uh, with four, four points, right? We can rotate this numerical stencil by 45 degrees, or maybe we can take even more distant nodes, or maybe we can do a convex combination. There are, these operators are linear, so this is also a legitimate discretization of the Laplacian. So somehow I would like to convey this picture that we can try to get rid of the graph to do learning on graphs. So now the graph, we want it to become just a discretization of something continuous. And here I would like to make an analogy again to some methods that were developed in image processing. And this is a non-Euclidean type of diffusion or the graph will try flow. So the nonlinear diffusion, the, the adaptive diffusion that we've seen before, basically it's a nonlinear uh, equation, right? Where we have this uh, position dependent diffusivity function that stops the diffusion when it arrives to a discontinuity, right? So it's inversely proportional to the norm of the gradient. Now, a different approach was uh, that was actually developed by my PhD advisor, Ron Kimmel, and his collaborators, was to use a non-Euclidean diffusion on an image that is represented as a manifold. And in this case, we have a linear uh, equation with a, a non-Euclidean uh, version of Laplacian that is called the Laplace Beltrami operator. So here we consider the image as a, a two-dimensional manifold. So it is embedded in a joint space where we have the positional coordinates. So these are the positions of the pixels, X and Y, and the feature coordinates such as R, G, and B uh, channels. So an image in this way is thought as a two-dimensional surface or a two-dimensional manifold in R5. Actually, this space doesn't need to be Euclidean. And then we can pull back the metric from uh, this embedding. Basically, we define a Riemannian metric a two by two matrix in this case on the on this manifold, and we can write uh, at the gradient flow of a generalization of the Dirichlet energy that we've seen before that is called the Polyakov functional. So it's harmonic energy of this embedding. It's used in uh, high energy physics since the string theory in particular. Uh, don't ask me uh, uh, what exactly it means. So my understanding of this kind of physics is is very superficial, and. Uh, the gradient flow of this functional is called the Beltrami flow, named after Eugenio Beltrami, one of the early uh, Italian differential uh, geometries. And this is how it looks like. So uh, if you take uh, right here the, 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 the way that this operator looks like, you will see that it actually looks very much like the, the Perona and Malik uh, edge indicator. So this is also a diffusion that, that wouldn't uh, blur things that are different uh, in space, uh, distant in space and in color. And maybe uh, visually the way to think of it is that now your distance depends not only on the distance between pixels, like in, in traditional uh, Gaussian kernel, but also depends on the distance in their color intensity. So somehow you run this kernel on this manifold that sits in the joint space. And uh, maybe a, an approximation, an incarnation of this is also what was popular uh, 20 years ago, the bilateral filter that uh, has a component that is uh, spatial dependent and uh, 
uh, intensity dependent. So it's uh, a Gaussian kernel that is modulated by the difference in the intensities. So applying this to graph uh, works in exactly the same way as before, but now we have two ingredients to the, uh, to the, the features of every node. So we have the feature coordinates and the positional coordinates. I denote them by u and x and together by z. So, and again, here you can see an, an example how it looks like. So we have the positional space where the graph is embedded. And you can think of, uh, usually it's impossible to isometrically embed a graph into uh, a continuous space, into a metric space, right? Uh, you can find uh, examples. So usually these embeddings try to preserve the neighborhood structure. So here we, we assume that there is some kind of embedding. So it doesn't really need to be to, to represent very accurately the graph. Basically, what we do with this diffusion equation, we evolve both the positional and the, uh, the node, the, the, the feature coordinates. So the evolution of the, the, of the feature coordinates represents the usual diffusion that we had before. But the evolution of the positional coordinates, you can interpret it as a graph rewiring. Because now I don't need to stick to the original graph. I can say if two nodes became closer as a result of this diffusion, to each other, I can change the graph, I can be wide, I can say that now I will propagate information between neighbors that became closer based on the downstream task, right? Because I remind you that we are parameterizing the diffusivity function and if my task requires the two nodes to become closer in this space, then I can change the graph to, uh, to help the propagation of information. Now, maybe this is a little bit cumbersome explanation, but uh, this is probably uh, a video that, that describes it much better. So this is the Cora graph, so the famous citation network that is used in all benchmarks of, uh, of GNNs. And a lot of things are, are happening here. So each node represents a paper. The connectivity of the graph represents citation. So it's a, made an, into an undirected graph. The color of the circle represents some features that are uh, represented as uh, RG and B channels. So again, it's a low dimensional projection. And the position of the circle represents a positional encoding, again, that is projected in two-dimensional plane for visualization. So you can see that the colors are evolving. So this is the diffusion of the features. The circles are moving. So this is the diffusion of the positional coordinates. And the graph is also changing based on the proximity of the node. So that's the graph rewiring. And you can see that this process separates different classes as they are supposed to be, because the downstream task is node classification. And we can also see that many uh, standard GNN architectures can be considered as instances of this frame that we call blend, build trimmy uh, 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 flow on graphs. So uh, whether it's uh, the GUT, the transformer, uh, uh, dynamic graph CNNs, uh, the previous model grand, right? So they're all particular settings. And of course, well, otherwise it would probably be impossible to publish. Uh, we can also uh, we can also uh, uh, outperform some existing methods uh, by a fraction of percent in standard benchmarks. Now, I, I hope that at this point, so there are at least some interesting things, right? So what I'm saying is probably not very surprising because at the end, what uh, graph neural networks do is some form of diffusion. So it's maybe discrete diffusion that is that is done uh, through message passing. But uh, yeah, basically, it's just a different view. And maybe the non-Euclidean version gives it an interesting differential geometric flavor. So I think we need to use differential geometry in a more elaborate way. And here, I would like to talk about uh, the problem of uh, uh, bottlenecks and the problem of our scorching and how these can be addressed using techniques from differential geometry. So this picture that we've seen before, right, where the nodes were moving, it's a little bit uh, unsettling for maybe people coming from, uh, 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 let's say, from image processing background, where uh, somehow you're doing some process on a domain and the domain is moving under your feet, right? So the domain is evolving. Now, in differential geometry, this is a very common picture because it's very common to take a domain, a manifold, and evolve it by some differential equation. And uh, these are geometric flows, geometric PDs, and probably by far one of the most famous ones is what is called the Ricci flow. And uh, basically, it, it's an evolution equation for the Riemannian metric of the manifold. 
by its uh, Ricci curvature. So if you look at this differential equation, it looks very much like the diffusion equation then uh, with maybe a very gross simplification. It's sometimes referred to as the diffusion of the metric. So it's temporal derivative on the left-hand side and the right-hand side. It's second-order quantity that is a little bit similar to the Laplacian. So it's a kind of diffusion, even though it, it, it works in a very different way. And you can see an example of what it does, right? So if you run, depending on whether you run it forward or backward, so if you run it in certain direction, then you have something that looks like a, dumb, a dumbbell. And here you have negative curvature, here you have positive curvature, and uh, it will become more sphere-like and eventually collapse into a point. And why this is important? Because this way you can characterize topological spheres. So you can, if you can think of anything that looks like a two-dimensional sphere, you can take a closed curve and collapse it into a single point, right? You cannot do it on a torus. For example, you have a donut and they have a, curve, a closed curve that runs across the donut. Whatever I do, I cannot collapse it into a point. And Poincaré conjecture that this way you can describe also higher dimensional spheres. So the proof was simple in two dimensions. It was simple also in four dimensions, but somehow it resisted in three dimensions. And uh, Richard Hamilton suggested using Ricci flows, it's actually his terminology, named uh, after Ricci curvature, and again, another uh, Italian differential geometer, Gregorio Ricci Corbastro. This kind of evolution is a, a, a technique proof. And it took quite some time until uh, Grigori Perelman managed to prove it uh, about 15 years ago. So that was the remarkable proof of the Poincaré conjecture using actually a more general result than Poincaré conjecture using the, this technique of Ricci flows. Now, what does it have to do with our graphs and graph neural networks? So we would like to characterize uh, this way the phenomenon of over squashing. And over squashing, I remind you, it's the failure of message passing to efficiently propagate information due to some structural characteristics of the graphs that are called bottlenecks. And it tends to occur in the problems where you have long distance dependencies, that you need information from distant nodes, multiple hops away. And molecules are a good example. So some chemical properties of molecule depends, depend on the behavior of atoms that are at maybe a far ends of the molecular graph. And it tends to occur in a graph where the volume growth is fast. So we have many neighbors and a lot of data from, from them to, to, to aggregate into a single vector. And it tends to deteriorate with depth. So if I propagate more, then uh, this problem uh, becomes, uh, becomes more problematic. And empirically, it was shown to be alleviated by graph rewiring. Even a simple graph rewiring is making the graph uh, complete or fully connected. Now, what we try to do in our work is to formally define over squashing in graphs related to structural characteristics of the graph that uh, can be described geometrically using some notion of curvature, and then use some uh, surgical process for graph rewiring that is inspired by the Ricci flow. So it's not exactly the Ricci flow, but it's something that is uh, a little bit similar. So we can think of over squashing in graph neural networks as a kind of sensitivity. So we have uh, a multi-layer uh, graph neural network of the message passing type. So we have basically uh, some multiple steps of message passing. And here we assume that these are our local functions that transform our features. So these are the message passing functions. Let's assume that their Lipschitz continues and their Lipschitz constant here are denoted by alpha and beta. So basically what we are looking at is how the output of certain number of layers at node i depends on input features at some distant node s, okay? And this can be captured by this uh, derivative, by the Jacobian. And what we show is that uh, we can bound it by some, uh, some expression that depends on the, the, on the Lipschitz constants, which is well, an obvious thing, but also on the structure of the graph. So, and you can find, of course, some better examples or worse examples. So trees, for example, are pathologically bent. So their over squashing is very strong. And you can see that the structure of the graph comes in here through the adjacency matrix that they denote here by A. But it's not clear, right? So somehow it's conflated in the power of this adjacency matrix. So we want something more nuanced. And intuitively, you see that something that looks like a tree is more problematic than, let's say, something that looks like a grid, 
So we want uh, some machinery to be able to tell apart between these structures. And in differential geometry, we have such machinery. And that's why I brought up the Ricci curvature. So Ricci curvature is exactly this kind of way of classifying the local behavior of a manifold. And uh, slightly informally, you can re uh, refer it, uh, to it as some form of geodesic dispersion. So you take nearby points that are denoted here by P and Q, and you send geodesics at, uh, that are initially parallel and uh, should, uh, that are shot out at the same velocity, and you see what happens to them, whether they converge, remain parallel, or diverge. So if they converge, then locally you look like a sphere. In this case, we say that the curvature is positive. If they remain parallel, then you look like a plane, a Euclidean space, so it's flat. And if they diverge, then you look like a hyperboloid. So that was one of the first uh, non-Euclidean geometries constructed by uh, Nikolai Lobachevsky. It has a negative curvature at every point. So similar thing can be defined on graphs. So if I take nearby nodes, right, they're connected by an edge, and I take uh, uh, edges that emanate from these nodes, if they form triangles, uh, so something that looks more like a clique, then I have an analogy of a sphere, right, or a positive curvature. If I see that they're forming rectangles, then I have something that looks like a grid. And if they don't form anything and they actually become more distant, then I see something that looks like a tree. And there are, of course, uh, it's not that we are invented a discrete analogy of Ricci curvature. So there are several constructions, in particular two. One is due to Foreman and another one due to Olivier. So Olivier curvature is related to, to optimal transport and theoretically it is more studied so by, by uh, big mathematicians like uh, the, uh, like Cédric Villani or uh, Alessio Figali, the two fields medalists. So it has a lot of theory, but Foreman curvature is discrete, so it's uh, easier to relate to, to our situation. And uh, here we propose uh, our version that is similar to Foreman curvature that we call the balance Foreman curvature. So let me skip the details, basically what it does. So it's an edge-wise quantity. So every edge can be assigned a number, the, uh, the Ricci curvature uh, of that edge. And essentially it looks at uh, triangles and rectangles of particular type uh, around this edge. Okay, so again, doesn't really matter. What is important that it reproduces the behavior that we expect in the continuous case. So cliques have positive curvature, grids have zero curvature, and trees have negative curvature. We can also show that it lower bounds the Olivier curvature, and we can show that if the graph is strictly positively curved, so we have a bound that is strictly positive on the, on the curvature, then the volume growth is polynomial. So again, we reproduce the same behavior as in the continuous case. And we can also bound uh, what is called the Chigger constant or the spectral gap of the graph. So Chigger constant is a kind of clusteredness uh, notion in the graph that tells how many communities we have in the graph. And the spectral gap refers here to the difference between the, uh, the first non-zero eigenvalue of the Laplacian and the zero. So the main result here, and again, allow me to skip the technical details, is that uh, if we have a graph in which the, the curvature is uh, negative, then we have a certain number of nodes for which this bound, the, the Jacobian, the sensitivity, is sufficiently small. So we have strong overscoring. And basically, in other words, it is negatively curved edge, edges that are responsible for the overscoring phenomenon. And uh, this is exactly the kind of nuanced analysis that we're looking for. Basically, the geometric characterization, local characterization of this overscoring phenomenon, which is kind of not very surprising, but it's interesting to see it. And of course, once we know it, we can propose a surgical approach that will just pick up these edges and remove them. So it's a little bit similar to, to the Ricci flow that, that uh, tends to harmonize the Ricci curvature of the manifold, and we call it the stochastic discrete Ricci flow. So we pick up randomly an edge with the smallest Ricci curvature, and we can also, uh, in addition to cutting it, also introduce other edges that basically modify the graph here and there with a few edges changed. And um, what is also interesting that, of course, this is not 
the only type of graphene wiring that exists. And one of the popular techniques uh, was introduced by the group of Stefan Gunemann at uh, the Technical University of Munich. That is called maybe a little bit ambitiously DIGL, that stands for Diffusion Improves Graph Learning. So what they do is they embed the graph using personalized page rank and then use the nearest neighbor connectivity in that space as the new adjacency of the graph. So it's a kind of diffusion of the connectivity. And this is how the, the new connectivity looks like. So what we show here in this paper is for a fixed sigma, so the strength of this diffusion, if we look at the Chigger constant of the graph that is UI using the Deagle approach, it is dominated by the Chigger constant of the original graph. So if the original graph was bent to start with, we cannot really improve it by diffusion. And here's a, a, one of pathological examples. Uh, we have two clicks that are connected by a bridge. And in this case, the Chigger constant uh, for a large n is nearly zero. So no matter what you do, you will not improve it. So basically the conclusion is that Deagle is probably not an appropriate term. Connectivity diffusion doesn't necessarily improve uh, learning on graphs, or in particular, it doesn't improve the graph bottlenecks. And uh, again, it's not surprising. So what happens is that uh, random walks or diffusion process tend to connect nodes with a small diffusion distance. So you tend to create edges within the community. And uh, this works well when the, your data is homophilic, when your neighbors are similar to you. But it can create disasters when the data is heterophilic, when the neighbors are different. And here is an example. So if the graph looks like this, so here colors represent similar features, then what Deagle will do, it will create a lot of edges within each community, right? And again, I'm just adding more neighbors that are similar to me, what could be bad, right? So I will just average out the noise so it can actually improve the performance of a graph neural network. But if the graph looks like this, then it uh, can create disasters. And what is also important that the surgical process uh, by curvature based rewiring uh, changes the graph very mildly. The diffusion of connectivity can change the graph very strongly. So in this example, it adds 300% uh, of new edges. And here are some results. So well, we have uh, in the, the final version of the paper, we have additional results. So it's, uh, it looks more impressive than here, but as expected, it works better in the setting of low, low homophily. So that's actually the challenging setting where graph neural networks tend to struggle. And we show that this, uh, this uh, rewiring based on, on curvature uh, uh, helps quite a lot. Now, I'm not saying that this is the method of rewiring the graph. I think it's just uh, maybe a naive and simplistic way of implementing the findings, the insights that we get from, from curvature uh, in this setting. So let me wrap up. Uh, I showed, uh, I hope, uh, interesting uh, links between graph neural networks, differential geometries, and PDEs. I didn't talk much about algebraic topology. So let me try to explain uh, what I mean here by algebraic topology and why I believe that, that traditional graph neural networks are not great because they're graph centric. So again, the traditional approach is take the graph propagate information on the graph, and then you have the analogy to the vice fred lemon and uh, it allows you to uh, reason about the expressive power of the graph neural network. Now, in many cases, you have even very simple structures like triangles that cannot be detected by, uh, by this way of doing. And you also have sometimes the, the structure of the input graph is not great, as we've seen in the examples of bottlenecks for propagating information. So de facto, modern graph neural networks decouple the computational graph from the input graph, and then this link to the, the vice relevant theory is broken. So what we try to do is with these new models is replace the graph by something else. And one example of what we can do, we can take the graph and build on top of it what is called a cellular shift. So a cellular shift considers essentially the nodes as vector spaces, which are connected by linear transformations. So the analogy to this from differential geometry is what is called a connection or parallel transport. When you can move a vector from one point to another in the plane, nothing happens to this vector. When you do it on a manifold, the vector rotates, for example. So there is some transformation that operates on it. And um, basically, 
if you think of standard message passing, so it assumes that the geometry of the graph, right, in this sense is flat. So you don't have, the connection is trivial. What we try to do, we show that if you endow the graph with this shift structure, so it gives it its, uh, uh, a non-trivial geometry, and depending on the choice of this, uh, 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 of what is in algebraic topology is called restriction maps, these linear maps that, that live on the edges of the graph, uh, uh, basically restricting these operations to maybe some symmetry group, so that would be the analogy of the structure group of the tangent bundle of a manifold, we can uh, make more expressive neural networks that are able to deal with heterophilic data that do not over, do not, do not over smooth, that uh, give us uh, better separation. So we can look at the limit case of this diffusion and uh, uh, describe the expressive power of graph neural networks uh, in this way. And I think it's a quite radical shift from the standard graph theoretical approach to graph neural network, looking at this a continuous diffusion process on a structure that is uh, that, 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 that comes from the graph, but is infused with additional thing. Another recent paper that, that, that we did is uh, looking at node-wise graph embeddings. So in most cases, as I said, you cannot embed a graph uh, isometrically. So you always make some distortion. And most of the embeddings try to recover the structure of the neighborhood. So a, a link prediction uh, application is, is, is classical. So I want to embed my nodes of the graph into some uh, space, a vector space, continuous space, such that the distance or the similarity in that space uh, represents whether the uh, nodes are connected by an agent, the original graph, right? So think of, for example, a recommendation system that suggests on Twitter whom to follow. You will embed the nodes of uh, the, the, the follow graph in Twitter, and if two nodes are close to each other, then you suggest that there should be an, a, a link between these, uh, these two nodes. Now, the problem is that uh, you inevitably have some distortion and high order structures like triangles or rectangles can be distorted very strongly. Actually, there are papers that show that, that you cannot represent these structures properly. Another thing, of course, that the geometry of the space, of the Euclidean space is not compatible with the geometry of the graph, even in the sense of volume growth. So in the Euclidean space, the volume grows polynomially with radius and exponentially with the dimension. On a graph, it grows exponentially with the radius at least in certain types of graphs like social networks. And therefore, hyperbolic spaces are more appropriate. The problem with hyperbolic spaces, so they are non-Euclidean, but they, have, they, are, they are homogeneous. They have constant curvature at every point. And the graphs are heterogeneous. So some uh, parts may be more uh, negatively curved, some parts may be positively curved. So you have communities, you have cliques, right? So you, you want something more nuanced. And what we show is, a construction of heterogeneous manifolds when you add an extra component that is a rotationally symmetric manifold where you can control the Vichy curvature by just a single parameter. And this way you can embed the graph in a manifold that matches the curvature of the graph, the discrete, the foreground curvature of the graph. And this way you can preserve better the local structures that go beyond pairwise uh, relations or pairwise interactions. So overall, this is a new set of powerful tools that allow to study graph ML problems for, from different perspectives. Uh, it is also interesting principle take on uh, positional encoding, graph rewiring, over smoothing, and uh, I think it's just the beginning. So uh, it's a very rich world that probably before has not been properly studied in this field, and there are many interesting connections and uh, many interesting techniques. So maybe an appropriate question where I have disagreement with my colleague, Petra Velichkovich, is it appropriate to call it uh, message passing? And uh, I think I don't have really a better name, so he calls it augmented message passing. I would say that when we are talking about continuous models, uh, at least in, uh, in the strict sense, message passing, I understand it as a, a discrete process of sending information between nodes when you have a continuous space maybe you should call it spatial coupling or information diffusion. But this is probably more a semantic argument. So I will stop here. Thank you very much, and we'll be uh, glad to answer questions.
Uh, fantastic. Well, thank you very much, Michael. It's intriguing talk, I have to say. We have quite a few questions, so let me try and, um, uh, and, and pose them to you. I think the first one is from our very own David Kreil. Um, the question is, what's the size and complexity of, of, graphs, uh, of graphs for which this approach, I believe that was um, uh, when you showed the benchmarks um, uh, on various things work? Are you modeling the whole PubMed 130 million um, uh, data points, basically, or sites here, etc. Yeah, so well, it's slightly smaller. So, uh, well, OGB archive is actually big. So, yep. uh, yeah. So we probably scalability is always a, an issue with uh, uh, neural differential equations, but we can well probably not the Twitter scale of a graph, but hundreds of thousands uh, of nodes are uh, definitely possible. Maybe millions. Very nice. Um, a question from Marvin McCutcheon. You mentioned the um, analogies between differential geometry, such as geodesic curvatures and graphs. Is there also such an analogy for fundamental forms, so theorema, egregium in graphs? And thanks for the nice talk. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, good question. Um, I don't know. So if you approach them from these perspectives, so graphs tend to be rigid in the sense that, so the uh, Theorema Egregium tells you that you can basically, uh, you can flatten some surface if it has zero Gaussian curvature, right? So uh, in graphs, usually this is not the case. So they, they, they are rigid. So if you try to embed them in Euclidean space, you need to, to make distortions. I don't, I'm not familiar with results of this kind, but yeah, there might, there might be, I would not be surprised if there are similar results. Very nice. Probably some um, results similar to Gauss Bonnet theorem, maybe. Okay. Uh, that's that's interesting. Thank you. There's a question from Konstantinos um Barampas, I hope, apologies if I uh, ruined uh, your, your name <laughs> with my pronunciation. Um, the question is, thank you for the wonderful talk. Uh, by using oscillators or diffusion equations on GNNs, um, as you've described, and taking the space of possible solutions to these, would you say that it says anything about the expressivity of GNNs? Um, uh, essentially, um, could that be a new uh, weissweiler lehmann like measure? Yeah, it's a good question. So first of all, about uh, wave type equations. So um, this is very different from diffusion equation, right? So these are hyperbolic equations. Uh, we actually have a, a paper with collaborators from ETH, also it appears on archive, I didn't mention it. So talking about this uh, world of physical models, so diffusion is the most obvious one, but you can study other physical processes, whether classical or quantum. So one of them would be oscillators. So you can think of learning on a graph as a dynamic system of uh, mechanical oscillators that are coupled by the graph. And uh, what we show is that actually, well, this is very different from the typical behavior of graph neural networks that tend somehow to, to, to be more of a diffu diffusive type of behavior. So the wave-like behavior, oscill oscillatory behavior is not common in graph neural networks, at least to my knowledge. We show that you can, uh, uh, outperform, first of all, uh, some standard uh, graph neural networks, even if you use a standard layer like GCN or GUT as uh, this coupling and you uh, wrap it into uh, basically into a, a differential equation that, that, that runs these oscillators, you get better results. Whether you can talk about expressivity, so we show that it doesn't offer smooth, for example, so we can look at the limit case of the DHL energy. Uh, expressive power is, is a tricky thing, so that's why I uh, maybe I, I can put it as kind of uh, wishful uh, thinking. So if we can show that you can reach certain state in this system uh, within certain time, so you can talk not only about expressive power, but efficiency, how quickly can I get to a certain solution and how far can I be from this solution? So uh, there have been some works that related vice versa lemon to um, the more traditional approximation theory type of results. But usually, a vice versa lemma is a kind of uh, binary output, right? So whether you, you can represent certain graph function or you cannot, right? So here you can say how far or some kind of density results, whether it can be uh, arbitrarily close to a certain class of functions uh, by a solution of a diffusion equation or a wave equation. Okay. Very nice. Yeah. So maybe it was a little bit uh, convoluted and cumbersome, but I hope it answers some of the questions. No. 
It's great, thank you. Uh, there's a, you mentioned ETH. There's a question from from Henry Martin. Um, a general question on rewiring: Shouldn't we take the graph topology as given, so it doesn't uh, so doesn't rewiring destroy the given structure of the problem? Yeah, this is a very good problem. So uh, there have been some papers trying to understand it. I think uh, one paper from the Google for Roger Vattenkoffer from ETH asking what is more important features or the graph. So the problem with uh, graph neural networks, so this is nuanced but very important that uh, the graph has, comes in two roles. So it's part of the input, like in a molecule. So the graph is actually, it represents uh, chemical bonds. So it's as important as the atoms, not only what kind of atoms you have, but also how they are connected. But it's also the computational structure. So that's the kind of roads on which you send your information. Now, whether you should send the information along the same graph is a good question. In my opinion, no, you shouldn't. So in general, what I think what should happen, you should have two different processes that are coupled. One is evolution of the domain, let's say a graph, so rewiring, a discrete version of this will be rewiring. And another, another one is evolution of the features, let's say the diffusion. So think of a coupled diffusion equation of the features and the coupled diffusion equation of the metric, the Ricci flow, right? So if you couple them and they can happen at different time scales, so one of them can happen very fast and then you get this, the traditional rewiring that is pre-processing, but it can also happen throughout. So this will correspond to these latent graph learning methods where the graph is rewired uh, uh, as you go uh, in the graph neural network, uh, different layers. I understand. So um, adding my own question here. So, so would I would I describe this as correct that you say, well, we have a graph that describes comes from a problem. Um, maybe we find a differential equation or decree a differential equation based on the, let's say, um, uh, embedding we want, and then we rewire the graph based on that. Yeah. So that would be one way of doing it. Right. Uh, instead of rewiring, you can think of some kind of reweighting. So reweighting, not in the scholar sense, but basically attaching to it some uh, non-trivial geometry. So the transport map uh, uh, through the cellular shift. So you change yeah. the structure of the of the object. So it's not a graph anymore, right? So it has some more yeah. stuff living on it. So the graph is just the underlying structure. Uh, uh, you can also add uh, more structure, like for example, uh, by what we call the lifting operator. So uh, you take, for example, cycles and you uh, represent them as a, 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 a standalone entity, a, a cell. So you not, not only have nodes and edges, you also have cells that have boundaries. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's the cell or cell complex. Mm -hmm. And, the, and you can do message passing on, uh, uh, on all of these. So this makes it strictly more powerful than WL because, for example, all the problems of not being able to detect uh, triangles in graphs are now gone, right? So you have these structures built in. And it's interesting actually that curvature, it looks at these kind of structures. So if you think of uh, structural encoding, so that was another paper that we did uh, that, that probably started all these uh, ideas of uh, sub, uh, subgraph structures. So essentially the simplest way to do it is to uh, count uh, some given substructures in a graph and uh, use them as your positional or structural encoding to attach them to every node or every edge. And uh, by appropriate choice of the substructure, it can be more powerful than the, the, the vice for element test. Now, uh, curvature does something like this. So it's maybe less uh, detailed than, uh, than the, the specific count of substructures. So it somehow agglomerates uh, certain types of structures, in particular rectangles and triangles. But uh, you can think of it as a kind of uh, structural coding. So it's something that is more powerful than the degree of the node. Mm -hmm. Very, very interesting. Um, uh, sorry, I, <laughs> that I, I hooked your time there. Um, we have a question from Christian. Thanks for a great talk. I think it's Christian Eichenberg, actually. Sorry about that. Uh, thanks for a great talk. Um, could edge features be easily integrated into Baltrami flow? So blend into the blend approach. Or did I miss something? Yeah, it's a good question. So we didn't integrate uh, edge uh, features 
I don't say immediately. Well, of course, you can just maybe transform them into some scalar weights, and that, that would be trivial to, to, to do weighted graphs. Uh, H features can certainly be integrated into uh, the, the shift diffusion that they didn't present, where you have uh, matrices, operators on the, on the edges of the graph. So we learn these, uh, these matrices from the, uh, from the known features, but you can also make, uh, make them dependent on H features if you have such. Approach. We have another question from Marvin McCutcheon. Considering geometric objects with attributes, um, nominal or numerical, how uh, would you combine the geometric as well as attribute space for geometric deep learning, e.g. an embedding or specific ANN architect architecture, knowing that the attributes are correlated? You mean uh, categorical features, right? Um, I guess so, yeah. Probably through some form of encoding. I don't know. I don't have an immediate answer. I need to think. No, no, fair enough. Um, uh, there's a question from Andre Christian Rad. Great talk. Thank you. Um, do you think graph diffusion approaches would work well on small graphs, hundreds of nodes? Um, have you thought about applying these approaches in spatial temporal prediction tasks? I'm working on traffic forecasting. <laughs> very, very topical. Yeah. Actually experimenting uh, with integrated grant uh, right now. Thanks again. Yeah, interesting question. So yeah, so uh, with spatial, with temporal graphs, right? So graphs that evolve in time. So in, in, in our diffusion equations, we have pseudo time. So the diffusion time is, well, it's, it's the analogy of layers in graph neural networks. Whereas in temporal graphs, the time is, a, is actual physical time. And uh, again, maybe thinking of it as a kind of control problem for a physical system. So think of, I don't know, an airplane that, uh, that takes off at one point and then uh, flies and lands at another point. So it's a, uh, it's a system that evolves uh, in time and you can control it by some, some uh, trajectory in the parameter space. I don't know, raising or lowering the flaps, right? Or, and, and so on, so whatever are the control surfaces of, of an airplane. And um, yeah, so basically taking into account not only the end of this process, but the dynamics uh, might be interesting. So I would say that, that looking at the dynamics could probably be the right approach to, 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 you know, to these kind of problems. Thank you. I have a, um, a final question from Bahara uh, Shakiba. Uh, thank you for a great talk. Uh, do you think graph diffusion uh, approaches would work well on 3D shape analysis tasks? Yeah, certainly would, and I can even point to a paper, uh, I think very interesting paper done by uh, uh, my, co my colleague uh, Max Ovsanikov from Ecole Polytechnique. Uh, I think it's called uh, DiffuseNet. Uh, so what they do is actually interesting, so it's uh, uh, on meshes or on manifolds. On meshes and manifolds, they have more structure. So what they do, they do uh, uh, isotropic diffusion. Uh, which you can actually express in closed form on manifolds through the heat kernel. So they allow the, the isotropic diffusion for a certain time, and then they change the metric of the graph, roughly speaking. So basically, it's a kind of diffuse, then steer the diffusion, and then diffuse again, and then steer it again. So this way, you get uh, uh, an isotropic diffusion. Uh, uh, so that's uh, also a form of this nonlinear diffusion equation that we do, just do it slightly differently. Yeah, so uh, at least first example that comes into my mind before deep learning, we've been doing a lot of these kind of things on, on meshes. So uh, even something similar to blend. So uh, Fisher wear diffusion for uh, uh, creating uh, heat kernel based descriptors for meshes. Yeah, so actually, at least to me, because originally I did a lot of work in, in that space. My inspiration for graphs come, comes from these methods. So in computer graphics and geometry processing, the uh, similar stuff has been done for two decades approximately. Very, very interesting. I mean, as a as a hobby, algebraic and geometric uh, um, uh, topologist um, and, and the analysis side of it, I mean, this is a huge door you, you open here, right? Because there's, there's all sorts of invariants like Atiyah Singer index theorem, I mean, essentially, if you can basically boil it down to an equation, you can change the graph completely. But I guess that's the the key bit, as 
the earlier question sort of yeah. showed which I, I, yeah. I totally agree I totally, so so one caveat here and I hope we are beyond this so I was always somehow afraid so we have this fancy terminology right and fancy tools like seller sheaves and algebraic topology so my uh, constant fear is whether it will be new methods in name only so we just uh, write some fancy formulation and uh, and then we end up doing the same things, uh, maybe just coding them in a different way. So I think, no, we are probably beyond this. So that, that was also one of the criticisms about geometric deep learning. So, okay, you explain some old stuff like CNNs, can you do new stuff? So I think equivariant message passing is a good example, what is used in AlphaFold. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is uh, a geometric architecture that comes from these uh, geometric ideas that exploits the symmetry of the domain and the data which uh, to my knowledge has not been done before. So this is really new class of architectures. And uh, you can also relate it to physics because in physics, you have this notion of internal and external symmetries, the symmetry of the space and the symmetry of the field. And this is also related to the graph. So we can talk about, for example, the curvature of the graph and the curvature of the, uh, of the bundle, right? Or the, the shift that, that, that we build on it. Uh, I, I think there is a lot that can be done, and that is probably not trivial. So with shift diffusion, we see that we can prove results, for example, uh, how these kind of even very simple convolution type neural networks behave in the limit case. It's separation power, it's lack of forest smoothing, what happens when you have heterophily versus homophily. So it gives a bunch of theoretical results. It also gives uh, efficient numerical scheme that outperforms existing methods. Uh, I think it's very interesting. I think it's very interesting. I mean, do you even think that, I mean, and, and maybe here I also parade my ignorance about <laughs> algebraic topology, but, but you know, a lot of things in cohomology theory would be having long exact sequences so you can actually calculate things, right? Or the hexagonal sequence of uh, index theorem that you can have a six term exact sequence and that allows you to even calculate these invariants. But they are, you know, calculable because they're very well-defined objects. Of course, if you could calculate now much more complicated objects, that could even open the door the other way around, right? You could, yep. you don't need um, groups and rings and, uh, you know, the K, K theoretics or just make a, a semi-ring and make it into a ring and so on and so forth. So seems very broad, this approach. Yeah, so, so in, uh, in some sense, so of course, uh, uh, topological data analysis has also been around for about 30 years, maybe. So many of these ideas have been done or considered before. And uh, now with deep learning, maybe they, they come finally to, to, to fruition. So they start working, uh, which is also very interesting. Very nice. Michael, I thank you very much for an absolutely interesting talk. Uh, thanks very much, everyone, for listening. We'll send out a survey um, at the end, and, and you can give us maybe advice what, what we at IRA can, can, can do better. Again, Michael, it was really enjoyable. And uh, everyone, have a nice and safe evening. Take care. Thank you.